this opportunity to communicate your word. We ask for the leading of the Holy Spirit. I ask for God for the grace of inspiration and that of assimilation. That your word will come and enjoy your backing to bear fruit in our lives. That all glory will return unto you through Christ our Lord. Today, by the special grace of God, we'll be looking at a very important topic, kingdom marriage. We'll be looking at marriage from the kingdom aspects, the kingdom of God, to know the will of God. And we have, we are going to kick off by looking at the word of God in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Verse 4 a, it says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. I just want to begin by saying in the first place that marriage is the will of God. And marriage is the plan of God. It's willed by God. It enjoys the favor and the backing of God. Right from beginning we see God starting the human race by ordaining marriage thereafter. Before we forge ahead, let's look at some uh, definitions. Marriage, according to dictionary definition, is a legal union, a legal relationship between a husband and a wife. It also refers to the ceremony in which two people become a uh, husband and wife. And then according to the Matrimonial Causes Act and the Marriage Act definition, say that marriage under the act is the union of a husband and the wife for life to the exclusion of others. Marriage in the Greek is called gamos and it simply means wedding or nuptia. And today we are looking at the kingdom marriage, which has to do with the marriage that is for the children of God or according to the will of God. Why is it so? Because there are different types of marriage. We have customary marriage and many other marriage types according to different religions. But we have marriage according to the kingdom of God for those who are in the kingdom and those who are seeking to do the will of God. And that is what we are going to look at. And in looking at this marriage according to the will of God, we now go to creation and the beginning to see the sequence how God ordained it. In the first place, going to Genesis, the book of beginnings, we see the sequence for marriage. Number one, as we have already said, that marriage is the will of God. Number two, it is important to understand that even though God had marriage in mind, he started with a single, because there are things that should be put in place before two people are to join together. And that is what I call the marriage sequence. And sequence number one, under this number two, the sequence number one is a God-man relationship. God wanted man to have a wife or a family, but he didn't just give man a wife have been issued. Just immediately man was created. So Adam woke up not to see a woman or a wife but to see God, to interact with God, meaning that the first step to marriage is a godly relationship. When somebody has a good relationship with God, when somebody understands God, then the person is being prepared to make a choice for marriage. Step number two is that after a while, God put Adam in a garden. In other words, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, verse 15, God gave man a work to do, an assignment which we see as the purpose of existence. No man is qualified to marry who has not discovered his purpose of existence, the reason why God created you, the assignment heaven has for you, the work you are to do for God. And I always tell people that you are not supposed to propose until you have discovered your purpose. This purpose is so important. Why? You must be doing something for God before you ask God to give you somebody that will help you to do that thing. And so, if a single man, a single woman, is not doing anything for God, you shouldn't pray for marriage if you have not discovered your purpose. Why? If you ask God to give you a helper, the question will be a helper to help you do what? 
What are you doing for God that will make God to give you a helper? The, the, the other thing about this purpose is that it is when you discover your purpose that is when you now know whether you are even supposed to marry or not. Because even though marriage is good, even though marriage is the will of God, it's not everybody that should be married, that should marry according to the purpose of God for your life. So if God has called you in an order, order of celibacy, it's not a must that marry, you should marry, just like St. Paul. He said it's even better that you remain as I am. He did not marry. He discovered the purpose of God for his life that he's not supposed to marry. So part of the reason God starts dealing with singles before he comes to family is because it is during the period of singleness that you are to prepare for your marriage. So there are many reasons for being single. One of them is just to discover your purpose. It is when you discover your purpose that you'll be able to know whether you should marry or not. The second reason for starting with single and concentrating on single is what we call kingdom service. First Corinthians chapter 7, St. Paul said that when you are single, you devote almost all of your time, everything about you, to the service of God. But the time you are married, attention is not divided. And that's why the Bible said, serve God in the time of your youth, when you are still young, especially when you are single. That is the reason for singleness. The third reason for singleness is what we call filial responsibility. You need to give full attention to your family when you are still single. Because the moment you marry, another family is created out of your family. And that your immediate family, you and your spouse, becomes your primary or the first responsibility. And therefore, why you are still single is when you are to give proper attention to your other family, to your family. The fourth reason for being single before marriage is that one has to do what? Prepare to be an asset and to bring an asset into the marriage or family life. It is the time we are being single that you are supposed to work on yourself. Capacity building, we call it. Increase in value. Get educated. Do research. Know all you are supposed to do and to know and so on and so forth. After that, then you see now that when you get eventually married, you are not just entering that marriage as a liability. You have some. So we are looking at Adam to see how God used Adam and the steps that God guided Adam before marriage. So going back to the original numbering, the number three in the life of Adam is that God gave Adam four streams. According to Genesis chapter 2, there were four streams. The Bible recorded that one leads Adam to where there is gold. Another leads Adam to where there is silver. And this has to do with the economic value. You need to put economic value on yourself before you begin to think of marriage. In the financial balance, they call it uh, streams of income. Meaning that one is not supposed to have just one stream of income. Because any of the streams can dry up. So God gave Adam river that divides into four it stands for diversification so that if this one does not work well there's another place where soccer is going to come from these are the steps we are looking at and then adam was given an instruction to obey said you out of all the trees in the garden this is the one you are to eat and this is the one you are not to eat from eat from every other one except this one so there is an instruction he was obeying and when god has seen the life of adam god now say it is not good that this man should be alone i am going to give him a helper because he's already doing something he needs someone to help him fulfill that his destiny that is purpose of existence and that is when god now decided to create what and a help meet for for him and god used the word help meet which is very very important meaning that is not just every spouse every partner every female or male that is suitable for the other so in marriage to get the kingdom marriage and family you'll be able to make sure try do what is needed to get the right person the help that is meet for you meaning the one that is suitable for you meaning the one that is qualified for you there are about seven billion people on earth today but not every female is suitable for me not every male is suitable for a female and so it is now the, the onus is upon you to be able to get get it right to pick the right person that is for you so when every other thing is in place then you are now getting ready to marry now it is 
sometimes there is something striking in the scripture that sometimes we overlook. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper meet for him. So Adam heard God talking that, and Adam was expecting God to bring a helper, a woman. But verse 19 said, God did something. God brought animals to man instead of a woman. And what, what did Adam do? Adam named them, but he did not find a suitable companion in them. Meaning, Adam himself knew what is suitable for him. If he didn't know what was suitable for him, probably Adam would have married a monkey or a chimpanzee. I'm sure there is a resemblance. But the Bible said, God said, I will make him a helper. And God went and brought animals. Adam named them, but did not find a suitable companion. What does that, what is the lesson there? That as a single person, before you begin to think of who should suit you, you need to know what you want. So that when you see it, you will know it. You need to know, you need to understand that this is the type of person that suits me. This is the type of person that appeals to my desire, my heart desire. If your heart desire is in tandem with the leading of the Holy Spirit, it has to be the will of God for you because it is God that places that heart desire in your heart. It is not just enough to get what you want, but also to want what you have gotten, which is the second part of it. Many people get what they want, but afterwards they discover they don't want what they have gotten because that's not their heart desire, so to say. So God brought animals for man. We don't know how long the animals stayed with man before God eventually brought Eve. But there's a lesson there, meaning that marriage is not as easy as many people think. The, why many marriages break today is because there's no adequate preparation. There is a lesson that before a male qualifies to become a man to get married, he would have followed the many steps as we have outlined a relationship with God, discovering his purpose, and also part of it is living with an animal. Why is it so? Why am I saying so? Because relationship is to be trained. Relationship is the number one source of stress on earth. And so living with animal made Adam to do what? To tame his own excesses. And what I tell people is there is a reason why God allowed Adam to live with some animals before he brought a woman. Animals had to teach him some patience, some humility, and so on and so forth. And in our contemporary time, if it's not possible to live with an animal, the alternative is that you have to live with your younger sister live with your younger brother, your elder sister, anyone, or even a, a housemaid, somebody that will help you to understand the relationship first before you go to the one you are supposed to stay with forever. Somebody that you can hire and fire before you go to the someone you cannot hire and fire because marriage is a relationship for life according to the will of God. That's why the Bible says, He that made them made them male and female. And for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one. So if you cannot live with your younger sister, what makes you think you can live with another person's sister is a food for thought. If you cannot live with your own elder sister or younger brother, what makes you think as a woman that you can live with another person's brother as husband if you cannot live peacefully with your own brother? If you cannot live peacefully with your own sister, what makes you think you will live peacefully with another person's sister? What makes you think that the woman you are going to marry will be better than your own sister? Meaning that your sister's relationship with you is to teach you how to be patient, how to be humble, how to tolerate, and how to enjoy relationship. Or if all those things are in place, you are now qualified. You have graduated from a boy to a man fit to be married. On the other hand, if you look at the sequence, that when God was to bring the help meat for Adam, God did something. He took a rib, as the Bible said, and went on a journey. We don't know how long it stayed, but the Bible says he made sure Adam was in a deep sleep so that there would be no interruption. And God went somewhere, but by the time God was coming back with Eve, wow, immediately Adam woke up and saw Eve. He saw something in Eve that he did not see in the chimpanzee. He did not see the monkey that God brought, the way God was bringing Eve. But immediately he saw Eve, there was an attraction. He shouted, wow, at last, this is bone from my bone. The Bible says he was asleep. How did he know it was bone from his bone? If he had not had a picture of what he wanted internally before seeing her externally. See, this is now the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Eve because 
woman because she was taken out of the man and so on and so forth. The picture to learn here is that the female must know, in addition to what I've said about the preparation in Genesis chapter 2 for the male, that uh, the woman came from the part that protects the heart of the man, which is the rib. Meaning that every woman is to protect the heart of her husband when it comes to kingdom marriage. It is your duty to make sure the heart is preserved, just as the rib cage protects the heart. And that is why when a man has heart attack, you begin to look at the type of woman he is living with. Probably in most cases, 80% she has a hand in it. It is their duty. That is the will of God. We are looking at marriage, you know, according to the will of God. Kingdom marriage. Also, the bone is what gives shape to a human body. And in every family, every marriage, it is the duty of the woman to give shape to that marriage, to give shape to that family. When the family is scattered, when the family is not in order, it is the woman's duty by the creation, by the will of God, to give shape. So put your family in the way it is supposed to be. The third thing about the female is that the female had two formations. Unlike the male, there is something God did with the female that he did not do with the male. The day of creation, they were created. But Aunt Eve had another formation that Adam did not have. It was this second formation that made Eve irresistible to the man. When the time, by the time God finished with her, the man could not resist it. And that is the only reason why a man is ready, will be ready to leave his father and mother and cleave. To his wife because there's something in her that can he cannot resist meaning what anytime god has finished with a lady he begins to be irresistible it doesn't matter how physically ugly you may think a woman is as long as god has finished with her she will be irresistible there must be someone who is willing to die for her just to have her and that is how it started the lesson here is if nobody is asking for your hand in marriage if nobody is asking you, how are you? It is part of it is a sign or an indication that God has not finished with you. For when God has finished with you, nobody, you, there's no way you, they will say you are not sellable. Praise the Lord. Now, looking at it at the other way around, it was God that now eventually, when he finished with Eve, brought Eve to Adam. Eve did not run to Adam, as many people are doing today, running to the man. That is unbiblical. That is against the principles of the kingdom. It's not for the woman to hook to the man, to run to the man, to pursue the man. Allow God to finish with you. By the time God finishes with you, when the man sees you, he will always be ready to leave in order to cleave so that you become one with, with him. And that is how marriage begins to start. And now to talk about the sequence to marriage, let's look at a few things. The first thing there is dating. The word dating comes from the word D-A-T. Comes from the word D-A-T, meaning a uh, digital audio tape. And tape is for recording. When you add A to D-A-T, you get the word data. And data has to do with retrievable information, meaning that dating is about diary, it's about date keeping, it's about record keeping. If you put E to the D8 instead of A, you now get the word date. A date is just a meeting for record keeping. It's not just it's not for date rape. It's not to do many other things that people do. No, it is a meeting for you to keep a diary and then be able to make your records retrievable information that you can use to pass judgment. After dating comes the next thing, that is courtship. Dating is a casual observation, but courtship is when from the dating you have now developed interest. You now make it known to this person. If it is the will of God, we are going to live together. Let's pray about it. When somebody tells you as a woman, if it is the will of God that we we'll live together, he has not made any promise. That is what is known as conditional clause. It's not for you to give him yourself. It's not for you to abandon yourself to him. Think ability to know whether you are compatible, to know whether you, 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 you are the help meet for him or meet for her, something like that. And what you try in this courtship is for compatibility, meaning that if you are a fish, you shouldn't fall or rise in love with the other one if that person is a bird. Why? Incompatibility is against you. The fish cannot fly and the bird cannot swim. This is the reason for courtship. So when you are sure 
of compatibility. Then you progress to the third step to marriage after dating, after courting. The next one is engagement. Engagement is very, very important. Engagement is the link between singlehood and marriage. Engagement is a willful surrender and submission of oneself to a lifetime of bondage or a lifelong yoke. And that's why many people don't know when you say you are engaged, you are in bondage, you are getting hooked. And that is why you need to know who you are to be hooked onto. What is engagement? It is a willful acceptance of another person's assets and liabilities as your own. A willful acceptance of another person's assets and liability. There are many people who go into marriage simply because of the assets. But they forget that in every asset, there is also a liability. And so, before you get hooked, you need to consider the other person. He or she is beautiful, handsome, has pointed nose, has car, is a man of God, is anointed, is educated, he has baby feet. All these are assets. But that does not stop the person from having body order. Doesn't stop the person from having mouth order. Doesn't stop from the person from being nagging or hot tempered or so on or being too segregational and so on and so forth. So every person is both an asset in himself as well as a liability. Engagement is acceptance of such in a person. So that when you begin to see the uh, liability aspect, you wouldn't begin to say, oh, this is not what I bargained for. You need to know. And that is why we are talking to you. What are the assets? In marriage, kingdom marriage, Christ-likeness, character, compatibility, capacity, com com companionship, the one that will be a companion to you. And that's why you are not to marry out of compensation. Don't marry out of compassion. Don't marry out of confusion. Don't marry out of consolation. Don't marry out of compulsion or even commendation. Marry because you have discovered it is the will of God. While we're talking about this, many times people also make a mistake of thinking about marriage and they say, don't marry somebody you don't love. That statement does not exist when you talk of kingdom marriage. Marriage in the kingdom of God is not based on love. It's based on likeness. Sometimes if a man takes a lady, or a lady brings a man, say, Daddy, uncle, this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. The first question is, does he love you? Does she truly love you? Or do you truly love him? Or do you truly love her? No! Marriage has nothing to do with love. Why? Love is a command. When you ask me, don't marry somebody I don't love. Or don't, tell somebody, don't marry somebody you don't love, then you are insinuating that there is somebody he is not supposed to love, which is contrary to the will of God. The new commandment is love one. In fact, the Bible says even love your enemies. So if marriage is based on love, you are qualified to marry anybody, including those who know that they are your enemies. But marriage is not based on love. Life generally is based on love because love is a command. You are commanded to love everybody, whether you marry them or not. But you are not commanded to like everybody. So it is your duty to know what you like. Go for it because you will be responsible. And you are going to live for that person. Even if you don't like me, you must love me as a Christian. That's why we're talking about the kingdom of God. So you are not to marry me because you love me. You have to marry me because you like me. And what you like is not what another person likes. So likeness is personal, love is general, and marriage is personal. And therefore, you are to marry somebody or you like. And what you like depends on your own yardstick. What appears to you may not be what appears to me. Everybody has his or her own uh, heart desire. And that is exactly what we are talking about. Now, the most, let's look at marriage. Having done uh, engagement, when dowry has been paid, then you have entered into marriage. The next thing is celebration of marriage as a Christian. We're not talking about wedding, where the grace of God is brought into it. It now becomes a union for life. And that is why it is important to mention about the marriage vow. Sometimes people say it without understanding. When you say to have and to hold, it means you are saying commitment is, I'm bringing commitment into this marriage, not just contentment. When you say for better, for worse, you are talking about belonging, not his belongings, but that you are belonging to that family. 
to that to that relationship you are a part of it when you say for richer for poorer it means loyalty not property that you be loyal in that relationship when you say in sickness and in health it means support not just comfort but you are supporting you bring your support you support your partner to love and to cherish means faithfulness not gainfulness unfaithfulness is one of the things that breaks you know uh, one of the things that break many homes and many people many families have been shattered because of unfaithfulness yet we said to love and to cherish until death do us part means companionship not convenientship finally the three reasons for marriage is companionship procreation and then morality what does that mean god said it's not good that the man should be alone i will give him a helper God did not say it is not good that the man does not have a child. So procreation is not the primary reason for marriage. Many homes are in agony today because there is no child. Listen to me. Fruit of the womb is one of the fruits that God commanded man to bear. If you don't have fruit of the womb, there's fruit of the head. There's fruit of the intellect. There's fruit of the mouth. There's fruit of the hand. There's fruit of the pocket. There's the church calls it fruit of charity. There are many things you can do. Fruit of the womb is just one of the fruits. Nobody is barren. The primary reason of marriage is companionship. Is there are many people who are married today. They have children, but they are still lonely in that family. Meaning, they are not companions with one and with each other. So the first thing is companionship. Then the second thing is procreation, because God gave man the command to go and multiply. Then the third thing is what? Purity. Procreation here is not just to give birth like many people do, but to give birth to children you can train, you can help to be, to fulfill their own destiny. Then the third thing is for morality's sake, because St. Paul says it is good for you to be as I am, meaning that if you are not married, you have not committed any sin. But he say in order to, if you cannot keep yourself, for purity's sake, say go and marry. So marriage is very, very good. Marriage is the will of God, but marriage has to, you know, if you follow the sequence, then you'll be able to maintain and enjoy it. Because if you go outside the sequence, then you attract the consequence. The most important ingredient in marriage is understanding. Nobody, no matter your yardstick for marrying, nobody is 100% correct. But with understanding, you'll be able to cope up and live with whoever God has ordained for you to live. Remain blessed through Christ our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, dear viewers. I believe this message has blessed your soul. For a continuation of this message, the next episode will be centered on conflict management in a Christian home. Keep a date with us. For your information, further information, counseling, testimonies, you can contact us through the numbers, schooling, or the television sets. Remain blessed. Amen.